Um, so another um, advantage to having a mycorrhizal relationship, um, in addition to increasing access to soil nutrients, increasing the volume of soil access, increasing the access to smaller capillary pores, which is related to number one, um, as well as increasing access to immobile nutrients such as phosphate. <clears throat> Another advantage would be that uh, mycorrhizae can um, basically decompose organic matter um, themselves. They are fungi <clears throat> that have the ability to uh, secrete hydrolytic enzymes extra extracellularly to decompose organic matter. Which uh, makes um, which makes more nutrients available to the plant than they would otherwise have had access to. Um, okay, so decomposing organic matter to make nutrients available. Okay, so we're going to look at two different types of mycorrhizae. Uh, one type uh, here that's shown is ectomycorrhizae and they are a type of mycorrhizal association that um, develops a mantle on the outer surface of the root where there's a high concentration of hyphae uh, forming sort of a glove-like appearance and then the hyphae will um, penetrate between the epidermal cells and into the cortex, the root cortex cells. Um, the hyphae always remain in the apoplast uh, but they increase that contact area between um, the fungus and the root by penetrating all around the different cortical cells. Uh, but they never actually penetrate the, um, the protoplasm or the, they, they never pass through the plasma membrane. Um, so the advantages here are for increasing um, the surf, here we go, increasing the surface area of contact for uh, exchange of nutrients, carbon from the plant, and um, other nutrients from the soil. Um, and these, this type is common, this ectomycorrhizal type is common in pines and in oaks. And so if you dig up the roots, you'll usually see this little white filamentous attachments to the root, and those are the hyphae. Um, and let me spell that. Actually, hyphae, uh, I thought we were spelled in the figure, but they're not. So a hypha is a singular form and hyphae is plural. All right. Um, then the second type of, of mycorrhizae is shown in the next um, page here, which are endomycorrhizae, which is a general term. Um, but the, the term that's most often used is vesicular mycorrhizae or vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizae. And so they can be um, abbreviated VAM, VAM mycorrhizae. Um, this is the type that's present in most plant species um, that are mycorrhizal with mycorrhizae. And we'll just abbreviate that there. And arbuscules, for that name there, arbuscular mycorrhizae, Arbuscules, arbuscular mycorrhizae um, are basically, or, what, or mean, arbuscules, the term arbuscules means um, not tree, but ju not just tree, but move that over a little, but little trees. And so if we look at the diagram, we can see that in the cross section of the root, the fungal hyphae um, don't actually form a mantle, there's no mantle, um, but they penetrate directly into between the, in, in, through the apoplast of, uh, between epidermal cells, uh, then they continue again through the, into the apoplast between root cortex cells, just like ectomycorrhizae. But then they push these little branch sections um, against the cell membrane uh, in towards the, the space of the cell, the volume, the, the, not actually within the, the lumen of the cell itself, but basically what we're looking at is say, <clears throat> if we're sort of high, uh, enlarging what's happening here, um, let's say that this is the cell 
wall coming around that the arbuscule is pushing in. Um, and just inside of that is, I'm drawing as a dotted line, is the plasma membrane. So the, the, the cell wall gets sort of pushed inward um, with the cell membrane attached by, you know, to it or connected just adjacent to it and then the rest of the cell is out here. So the, the, the arbuscule never actually uh, enters the, the cell. It's still pressing against the cell wall and the cell membrane, but um, that again increases the uh, surface area of contact. Surface area. For again, the exchange of nutrients, um, carbon from the plant, and nutrients that are taken up from the soil, um, from fungus to root. All right, so advantages of um, of associating with mycorrhizae, um, uh, also what we talked before, having uh, root hairs, or having, um, well, it, regardless of whether these symbioses or um, root extensions are, are part of the root, or uh, if they don't have them at all, uh, when nutrients are taken up, then they're, um, the development of a depletion zone occurs around the root. So a depletion zone, or zones, and it's shown in plural here, are gradients, gradients of nutrients, um, or nutrient concentrations, nutrient moving away from the root. All right, so the, the gradient is such that it's low at the surface of the root, it's uh, higher, the concentration is higher away from the root, uh, some, some distance away. Um, now the, the, the width of these depletion zones uh, varies, let's say the diameter of the, the depletion zone or the width uh, varies according to nutrient solubility. Okay, so we see, um, for, but it also varies depending on whether root hairs are present or mycorrhizae are present or not. So in the first diagram, we're looking at a diagram here that shows um, where we have root hairs present and versus no root hairs. And so the depletion zone without root hairs is um, rather narrow, and this is for phosphorus. Um, whereas if the plant has root hairs, you can see the diameter of the cylinder surrounding a root, which was very thin here, is much enlarged with the presence of root hairs. Um, likewise, if you look down here where we have plus mycorrhizae present, <clears throat> you can see the depletion zone um, around the mycorrhizae is much larger than if the root had no mycorrhizae at all. Uh, but with root with uh, root hairs plus mycorrhizae, there is no you know gain really over having um, over the other two where uh, where ha root hairs and mycorrhizae are present. So um, ha developing these mycorrhizal associations is energy um, expensive, um, and so typically plants have one or the other. Uh, not to say that they never have both, but just generally speaking, they have um, one or the other. And there's probably some plasticity with that uh, in terms of time of year and um, phenology, uh, in its stage of development, um, and nutrient availability. Um, okay, and then speaking to the nutrients itself, as we said, the, the more soluble the nutrient um, the wider, as it turns out, its depletion zone. So we're looking at a graph here for the depletion zone of nitrate. And what we see is that the concentration as you move away from the root is very high. So as, um, as we move closer and closer to the root down the, the y-axis towards zero, we can see sort of a general decline in the, nutrient con in the nitrate concentration. But at some point here, you see this precipitous decline and that's referred to all in this dotted area here that's shown is called is referring to the depletion zone all right so then the question is 
Um, how would this depletion zone look uh, in comparison? How would we compare the depletion zone of nitrate with something that's less soluble like phosphate? Um, so if we were to hypothesize what that, that line would look like, would we draw the line? Let's see if we change our color here just to, to highlight we're looking at a different um, nutrient. Would we, would we look, expect um, a phosphate content to be sort, sort of high out here and coming along <clears throat> and get very, very close to the root before it, it declines? Or would, would we see a, a, a line kind of like this, a precipitous decline, much a sharper decline than with um, nitrate? Or would we expect, um, whoops, a uh, sort of gradual decline like this, where we have a shallower slope. So that's our question. Would it be A or would it be B? Um, so let, if we look at the next diagram here, we can see uh, some data with, with showing the depletion zone of phosphate. And we are looking at <clears throat> mycorrhizal versus non-mycorrhizal plants, and we're looking at a difference in um, nutrient um, fertilize, a difference in fertilization rates. Um, so we're looking down here at, say, where um, phosphorus content is low in the soil and there are no mycorrhizae, then we do see sort of at two um, centimeters compared to the nitrate um, a much lower phosphorus concentrations. And then we go down to one centimeter, and it's about that same level. Whereas in the nitrate, when we go down to one centimeter, we see a, that drop already starting. So we're already in the depletion zone for nitrate compared to um, what's happening with phosphate, where we haven't entered the depletion zone yet. It's not till we get even further closer, even closer to the root, less than one centimeter, that we see that depletion zone begin. So that's kind of one of the ways that we can compare um, depletion zones between different nutrients. Certainly uh, higher nutrient concentrations are going to affect that depletion zone and also the presence of mycorrhizae are going to affect that depletion zone as well. In fact what we see is that with mycorrhizae and low nutrient um, availability for phosphorus that that depletion zone is nearly uh, you know removed. Okay, so now we're going to move into a discussion of uh, basically once the nutrients reach the root surface, um, once nutrients reach the root, what routes of uptake are possible? Basically, how are nutrients taken up? Okay. If we are looking at um, water and dissolved ions crossing into the root, passing through the root, um, in this area of the figure, we can sort of blow that up over here and see uh, our familiar diagram where we have two different routes of transport. Um, the blue, if you recall, uh, demonstrates the, whoops, not apoplastic, but symplastic uh, route. And you should be able to name all the regions of the root here, the epidermis, the cortex, um, the endodermis, the pericycle, and then the vessel elements. Um, remembering that to access the symplastic route, these nutrients have to pass through the cell membrane up, up somewhere along the way here. Um, and then they just pass from cell to cell through these openings called plasmodesmata. So this is um, material that we talked about with regard to the movement of um, water. With the, the apoplastic route, we can see that water moves between the cells through the cell walls um, to reach the endodermis, is blocked by the Casparian strip, and then is forced across the plasma membrane of an endodermis cell and into then the vessel elements. So this is um, pretty much a, an overview of, or a review from what we've talked about before. When we're talking about um, the movement of nutrients through the apoplastic route, that space is that it's passing through is referred to as the parent free space. And sometimes we abbreviate it like this. 